it is important to study really hard. It's important to spend a lot of time in the library mm -hmm. and get good grades because that gives you the foundation to be successful in PA school. It also doesn't make you very interesting. So that's the place where the patient care, the shadowing and the service choices you make matter. It's because something is special about Rutgers. I don't know exactly what it is. I can't put a finger on it, but something is special about this program. So who better to ask than the program director, Dr. Kelferman? We're gonna talk about the program specifically. We're gonna talk about who gets in, why, PA school advice, how to get in, how to succeed, all that good stuff. So if you're ready, Dr. Kelferman, I've got a lot of questions. Helping others is a calling. It's not a job. Hey guys, my name is Boris. I'm a physician assistant. I am very, very honored to have a special guest today for you guys. This is... Uh, I am Dr. Lori Palferman. I'm the program director at Rutgers Physician Assistant Program in New Jersey. So you guys have probably seen my interviews with several of Dr. Palferman's students, Elijah, Michelle, James, Brianna, all of them sharing very inspirational stories, and they're all succeeding in their PA program right now. And then I decided to go right to the source because something is special about Rutgers. I don't know exactly what it is. I can't put a finger on it, but something is special about this program. So who better to ask than the program director, Dr. Kelferman? We're gonna talk about the program specifically. We're gonna talk about who gets in, why, PA school advice, how to get in, how to succeed, all that good stuff. So if you're ready, Dr. Kelferman, I've got a lot of questions. Sure thing, fire away. Let's fire away, let's go with number one. Uh, so first things first, Rutgers Physician Assistant Program. It definitely does, I've noticed, take a lot of responsibility upon itself, it does a lot more effort than some programs in selecting just the right kind of applicants. Can you tell me a little bit more about the program's philosophy regarding admission? Sure thing. Um, we take admissions very seriously. Um, not to sound cliche, but the people that we're accepting now are going to be the future of our profession. And so we cannot overstate how important putting a lot of time and energy into picking the best applicants for each class cohort. Um, there's, we really have two broad goals when we're looking at applicants. Uh, we think about um, what we want the workforce to look like, and we want the workforce to really reflect the patients that our graduates are going to be taking care of. So. We have, you know, in the United States here, we have a very diverse patient population, and we want to make sure that we have providers that are reflecting that diversity. And when we talk about diversity, we consider it in all forms, um, not just racial and ethnicity, uh, gender, um, economic background, because our providers that um, have some of these attributes, um, I think sometimes relate better um, or in a different way with the patients that they take care of. So that is one broad area. And then the other thing that we look for in applicants is we want them to reflect our program mission. And um, we, we, I talk about all the time with applicants that whether you're looking at Rutgers or any PA program, you should always look at their mission first. The mission pretty much drives everything they do from admissions, curricular changes, or revisions or philosophies, uh, clinical placements, who they hire as faculty. And so for us, our mission highlights a few things, um, humanistic patient care, dynamic curricular changes. We're always changing, we're always listening, we're always trying to do better, um, mentorship, and at the end of the line, we want quality, empathetic, competent healthcare providers. So we think about the end when we're thinking about admissions. Mm -hmm. Well, not to say too many good things all at once, but just from the few students that I've, I've seen, I think that you've hit the nail on the head every single time with all four of those folks. I mean, as far as mentorship, every one of them just couldn't wait to jump on one of these kinds of interviews, record, answer questions. Every one of them is comfortable with emails, like posting their email in the info so that students can reach out to them. And I know they're mentoring people. So 
that's something that's often overlooked is mentorship is huge. And especially as far as succeeding in the program. Yeah. Yeah. It starts with preparation of the application and throughout until graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we talk about our mission and some of these things, humanistic patient care, patient centered care. Um, in every course we, we teach in almost every lecture that we teach, uh, we talk about it all through the admissions process. And so for those applicants who are looking for that same sort of thing, it becomes bi-directional, right? So mm -hmm. we're looking for that in applicants and the applicants who are really interested in that are picking us. And so, I, and I know that you've said this probably, and you hear this all the time, when an applicant interviews or applies to a, a program, they're choosing the program just as much as the program choosing them. Mm -hmm. So I think for any applicant to figure out what the personality is of the program and see if there is a shared idea about um, philosophies, that's a really important thing for anybody applying to PA school. Yeah, I completely agree. And practically speaking, for those of you looking for advice on how to apply, things that you can do to kind of bolster your application, that's one thing that you definitely want to focus on, particularly in our interviews, because I know you write the personal statement, you make the application for all the schools you're applying to. So just focusing on kind of one school's mission might not be the smartest thing. Uh, but as far as your interviews, that's what you want to have prepared is like Dr. Pelferman said, the mission, the values, the thing that that school values, that's what you really want to talk about. And you should be able to talk about them very honestly if they also reflect in your personality. And if they don't, then it's not a great fit. You know, find a school that's better for you. Uh, but that's definitely something to focus on. And then and, and I'll just say, Boris, you just hit on something that we'll probably we'll talk about in other places. Mm -hmm. But really being honest in your application about those things, your own philosophy, your why you want to go to PA school. Um, because we're reading every word in the application. So if there's a mismatch between what you say your philosophy is and the choices that you've made in terms of seeking out jobs, volunteer experiences, mm -hmm. et cetera, they'll, that will be obvious. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm thinking of an applicant who, came, who was interviewed, who talked a lot about her um, connection to taking care of the underserved, how this was her life mission, but all of her, her patient care experience had been in a Beverly Hills plastic surgery office. So listen, a lot of PAs go into plastic surgery and it's transformative, cutting edge artistry. And the work they do must be incredibly rewarding. They literally can see the result of their work and they get the opportunity to experience positive impact that their patients have. So plastic surgery is wonderful. The issue for the student was the mismatch in between what she said and the work experience she had. So I interviewed her and I said, mm -hmm. well, this is, this is curious. Can you explain this mismatch between philosophy sure. and, and decision-making? And she said, well, I go to school at UCLA and there were no opportunities to work with the underserved. Really? Well, exactly. So my point is there's nothing wrong with working in a Beverly Hills plastic surgery office. Mm -hmm. If you can tie that to your why, mm -hmm. but don't make your why something different than what you're actually doing. So regarding that applicant, when I asked her the question about the mismatch, if she had said, I have this opportunity, I'm living in Los Angeles for four years, and it, I'll have an opportunity to work with some of the best surgeons in the world. And so I decided to take it. And I figured that any of the experience I received at the plastic surgery office would be transferable to any population I work with. That would have been a great answer. Or if she had said, um, the reason for the mismatch is I found a job where I made three times as much money working in the plastic surgery office as I would have made if I was working with the underserved and I was putting my way through school and sometimes you need to make practical choices. That would have been a great answer. So my point is, is it's okay to have something that might look incongruent. You just need to be able to explain it because when there is a mismatch, 
or it's questionable your authenticity about a certain subject, it calls into question everything else in your application as well. So you just you just want to avoid that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that everybody like down the line, every single person, 100% of students are insecure about some aspect of their application. So people who might be from an underprivileged background, might be a first generation college student, low socioeconomic status, whatever it may be, they might think, well, everybody who gets into PA school is rich and their dad was a doctor and X, Y, and Z. But what they don't understand is that those people that might be, you know, quote unquote privileged in some ways are also tremendously insecure about their application saying, well, my life seems too easy. My life seems too basic. I didn't seem like I struggled even though I really did. Uh, and you know, all of my experience is not uh, working with the underprivileged, it's from that Beverly Hills plastic surgery office. But we are here to tell you that it's okay. Whatever your life was, whatever your story was, and whatever reasons you have for becoming a PA and your life experiences that led you to that, they're all okay. Just make them congruent and authentic and know one thing is better. No, we're not trying to find cookie cutter students. We're trying to just know you and the real you and why you want to be a PA. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, be you, be authentic. Exactly. So, so what's, what's really interesting. So this is going to be kind of a tangent, but I think you're going to understand where it goes because it's going to be interesting. So one piece of advice that I've heard a lot from people, especially people suffering with anxiety and social anxiety is don't worry about what anybody else thinks because they're so worried about themselves. They don't have time to worry about you, which it's a calming thought until you try to get a little more successful. And then you realize every single thing you're doing is being judged. Uh, right. And so this is one of those things where I guess an applicant might not give Rutgers the credit for looking at applications as closely as you guys do. And some schools may not, but some schools like Rutgers, the, the benefit and also I guess the detriment is you're so holistic, you read every word. So you're looking for that fantastic person who's uh, demonstrated that they're very capable and they're consistent with their values. But at the same time, they're going to read everything you say. They're going to look at every single thing and see that it makes sense. You know, so if you're genuine and you've done the work and you are going to be a good applicant, then that's where you want to go. But at the same time, you're not going to get anything by it. Exactly. I mean, you know? I think that, you know, we mentioned early, the first step is having a really strong application. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning with the application, um, it's just words on a piece of paper. We don't have an emotional connection with right. the words on the paper. So any applicant, their goal is to get to the interview phase, mm -hmm. especially those students who might have areas in their application that might be considered weaknesses or maybe not as competitive as others. Mm -hmm. their, sole, their sole goal is get to the interview place where they can then, um, you know, make an impact in a more personalized way. Yeah, demonstrate their personality. Exactly. Exactly. So I think this is where a place where mentoring is so important to make sure that the application is strong. Mm -hmm. um, don't hide from those areas that might be less competitive. Um, I'm thinking of the, an application uh, that I just that I just reviewed the other day or I heard from somebody who was declined. So mm -hmm. For our program, we have a minimum GPA, overall GPA and science GPA of a 3.2. However, um, we will consider an applicant if they submit a letter of grade explanation. Mm -hmm. so this is really an opportunity for applicants to write whatever they, they wanna write about and just be honest about, I struggled because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So, um, if one doesn't explain the grades, I think sometimes applicants think, well, maybe they won't notice. We notice everything. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's better to be forthright. Mm -hmm. I struggled in this because of why. And just explain your why. You know, another area, let's say somebody doesn't have a lot of service. So mm -hmm. going back to that mission, we're very service driven. We have a philosophy that, um, that everyone gives back to their community in some way. So let's say somebody has very little volunteer time. That's okay, but if they explain it, that I was going to school full time, I worked 
full time. I was helping support my family. So I didn't have time to do a lot of volunteering experiences. We say, okay, that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes athletes have a really hard time fitting it in. That's okay. But if you don't tell us, we don't know. And so that's why the words on the paper um, are so important. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of another applicant who's, whose GPA was, um, it, it met the, the, the minimum criteria, but was on the lower side. Mm -hmm. They ended up, they were declined. And I spoke to the applicant afterwards. And I always say to anyone, whether they, before they apply, after they apply, if they end up speaking with me, I say, just kind of tell me your story. What's, what's going on? And, um, he shared this story about right before he started undergrad in August before undergrad started, his father died. And so while his overall GPA was 3.3, his first two semesters were low. Mm. So he shared this story with me. It was nowhere in his application. And I said to him, mm. you have to remember there's a human being reading your application. It doesn't mean that you are, um, you know, you don't have to go into all the private details of your life, but what individual reading your application wouldn't be understanding that your first two semesters of college were significantly impacted by a major loss in your life? Yeah. And that piece is helpful because we make the assumption or it, we don't know why one doesn't get good grades. Right? right. So if it's that they're partying too much, they're not organized, they're unfocused or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that's the default unless unless you you share that information. So I think it's important um, to, you know, share those things that are our weaknesses. The other thing I want to bring up before I forget is you talked about the um, the general CASP application. Mm -hmm. Right. So you want to think about writing in a generalist way for all the schools. However, many schools have supplemental application mm -hmm. components. So that's really your opportunity to speak to the specific schools directly about what it is about their particular school that is important. Yeah, completely agree. And I just wanted to bring it back to the poor guy that lost his father. I, I can't imagine that happening when you're so young. Yeah. In college. I mean, I guess I'm super grateful being 35, still having my father. So I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, no, you know, good, bad things happen to good people all the time. All the time. And good people make poor choices all the time. All the time. That's how we learn. We back, how do we look for that diamond in the rough? I mean, we're always looking for that, <clears throat> that applicant who addresses and takes responsibility mm -hmm. for some of those things that have happened in their lives that were setbacks yeah. and the philosophy is you grow from your disappointments and your failures much more than our successes. Right. So we listen to those stories. And I think some of the students that you talked about shared stories that were very eloquent. Now it doesn't mean that if, if you don't have a major thing happen in your life, um, those are the only things that, that move the needle. No, it's not a prerequisite. No, but I think it's okay to say mm -hmm. I was unfocused. I was immature. I hadn't lived away from home. I wasn't prepared what it would be like to balance X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. However, these are the things that I did to improve it. And if you notice, my grade trajectory is X. Mm -hmm. So it's taking responsibility, talking about how you managed, managed the situation and the improvement you made. Yep. So that reflection and level, that takes a level of reflection and maturity that we're looking for in the applicants. And that oftentimes makes the difference for um, the difference between applicants being screened forward as yes, recommended for interview or not. I think I, I think I kind of understand your philosophy a little bit more now because you could anybody can hire or anybody can accept the perfect applicant 4.0 gpa since they were in diapers you know had the perfect amount of hours had everything had volunteering because somebody basically helped them plan this from before they were even in high school 
you can have that and that person is likely to be able to handle the program and okay the end that's cool your philosophy seems to be you want people who have been through something come out on top because that shows character and that they'll be able to handle anything that we throw at them and that the world and practice throw at them so i would say that's true the other thing is, I, I think what you just said is is absolutely true mm -hmm. the other thing is when we face our own challenges and understand that life isn't so easy, we understand it and we can have empathy for our patients. Mm -hmm. So the level of being able to look at those things in yourself is, you know, with patient care, we create these lovely management plans with the patients and sometimes there it's easier to adhere to them to others other times. And so as a provider, you need to have that empathy to understand that, you know, sometimes they fall off whatever the management plan is. The philosophy is that we believe those who have had that happen to themselves probably inherently have that ability to have that empathy for the patients, mm -hmm. which also comes back to the mission of our program and um, having the workforce and that patient centered workforce that we're, we're looking for. That's actually a really interesting point about that whole thing. So some people can be insecure about um, issues with their application for a number of reasons, grades, experience, volunteering. Some people are insecure, even if they have all those things about maybe not having anything super quote unquote interesting happen to them, something, a, a struggle, something very challenging. And to those people, I would challenge you to say that, yes, you have. Even if you were that person working in Beverly Hills, went to UCLA, dad's a doctor, mom's a nurse, whatever it may be, you struggled with something. You've had something difficult that was for you very, very emotionally challenging. And you can talk about that because absolutely, there's nobody absolutely. on this earth that has not struggled. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's whatever sparks your passion, right? Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. It can be, I, you know, in the, in the essay, we're kind of jumping around, but we've had applicants who write about both of their parents being physicians and mm -hmm. sitting around the dinner table when they were little and hearing them talk about their patients and being fascinated about that. Yeah. And then that led to what actions it mm -hmm. led them to taking certain courses. It led them to having certain volunteer experiences. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, we're looking for is that you're not just falling into this. You know, oh, I thought I'd apply to PA school yeah, right. person. We're looking for the people who have given this thought. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, I, I, you know, I'm thinking of this applicant who wrote, I never knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I, you know, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be a PA. I spent a lot of time jumping from photography to, you know, hotel and restaurant management to X. And then I realized I wasn't really having any focus. So I started to do the work to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's when I found PA and I found this calling that I never knew I had. So, yeah. but then had the actions to show how they now had that passion. Mm -hmm. it, it's really about your why, why do you want to do it? And what do you put in place to make sure that this is the right fit? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think part of the criteria that we use is not only just finding, you know, I always hear who's the best applicant. I, I push back. There's no best applicant. There's no, the top applicants. It's really each person is a unique person, mm -hmm. and and that, and that's pretty much that's pretty much what it is. So it's there's no one story that I think um, matters, and I just have a. a I always say to students, because you said it, oh, you know, I'm just plain. I just, you know, grew up in the suburbs and oh, got really good grades. Oh, you say plain, like plain Jane? Yeah, plain Jane. They'll oh, say, my God, oh, no, you're not. Ordinary. That's it. They'll say, I'm just ordinary. I grew up in the yeah. suburbs. I went to school. I got good grades. And here I am. And so I just start asking some questions. Really? So tell me about your life. What did you do? What did you do? And then I can hear the uniqueness that they don't see within themselves. This is why the mentoring is so important. Everybody has it. It's very hard for some to identify what those things are. The other thing is turning, there are attributes that sometimes applicants see as a weakness or something that 
you know, they, um, they don't see as the attribute where we absolutely do speaking mm. a second language, speaking Spanish, mm -hmm. um, growing up in a family being first generation American, yeah. um, having gone with their parents to the emergency room and translating for them. Yeah. Or not, or moving here when they're five and not speaking the language and feeling like an outsider. Did you listen to my story? Because you just described literally my entire life. But okay, there you sure. go. I did not. But 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 so you as a PA, Boris, right. when you see that patient that is struggling with language, mm -hmm. who is um, who has arrived in this country after birth, mm -hmm. who sometimes feels challenges from that experience you might empathize with them in a very different way than somebody like me. So these things are attributes for mm -hmm. applicants they don't readily see. I completely agree. And to the question of why, I think you're definitely right. It's, it's not necessarily in our culture to be self-reflective. We reflect about everybody else's lives and about our hobbies and X, Y, and Z, but we don't really look inward as much, and that's kind of what you have to do to figure this out if you don't have your why, if you don't know your why. Um, but I think it will be helpful for both of us to share our why, because we're both PAs. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna start with the question, how do you figure out your why? Because that's what you wanna, like, that's the cornerstone, the root of your entire application. You know, everything has a storyline, it, it's all based on the why. So, right. shameless plug, I wrote a book on how to find your why for your PA school. Oh, I love that. Yeah, Elijah read it, all your people have copies of it. Um, Great. But question one is, think of a time when you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that you knew that you wanted to be a PA. I don't care if this happened during shadowing, working as a scribe, watching a TV show, whatever it was for you, I guarantee there's at least one time that you can think of that you just thought to yourself, this is what I want to do. I want to be a PA. And for me, it was two. One, it was watching an episode of Scrubs while I was an engineering student and just not really feeling passionate about anything until I watched that one episode. It's called My Old Lady. I think it's mm -hmm. season, season two. Yeah. Um, and there was that scene where the there was a terminally ill patient who was okay with letting go. You know, she realized she'd done a lot. She had a beautiful family. She climbed Mount Fuji. She spoke Japanese. It was, she had a life. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor was actually having difficulty, Dorian, difficulty mm -hmm. accepting her as, you know, that decision. And she actually made him feel okay about it. And then they played that Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah. And I just bawled my eyes out. I was like, I want to be a doctor. Uh, and then it turned into PA eventually. Um, but there was that. And then there was a moment while I was shadowing a PA where essentially something similar happened. She like hugged this patient and then they like had a moment. And I was like, I'm never going to get that as an engineer. And so I had a why. And I wrote about both of those moments in my essay. And, you know, five years later, seven years later, I'm practicing. Um, what was yours? So, um, so my, a little bit about my background, I grew up in a non-medical field family. Sure. Um, my father, uh, and mother both worked in business. I, um, I, right after college, I got a job as a pharmaceutical sales representative. I was really focused on business, marketing, mm -hmm. sales, and, um, I realized I became this pharmaceutical sales rep and I, that was really my first interaction going into doctor's offices besides me and a patient. So I was selling or describing the, you know, positive benefits of our medications. And it was the first time I was interacting across the table with physicians and PAs. And it was actually how I met my first PA. And um, so I, when you go to sales school, they, you have to learn all this information about the medications and how they work and biology. And I found I was good at biology and that I really liked science in a way that wasn't readily apparent to me as I went through my schooling, because it just wasn't what I thought I would be doing. So when I was sitting across the table from the physicians and PAs, I started to ask them, how do they like their job? I too thought about medical school and pretty much became set on this is what my path is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I would go into each sales call as the pharmaceutical sales rep and ask the PA or the physician, if you could, if you could do it again, um, would you pick the same path? A hundred percent of the PAs picked the same path. Mm -hmm. We're passionate. The passion I saw in the PA profession was 
was really astounding. The physicians, not so much. Um, oh, really? I think they, yeah, I think that what it was to be a physician at that time. So we're talking in the nineties when things were really changing in healthcare. So the idea of the physicians being the omnipresent provider, um, making more money than, you know, many other professions, uh, that was when things were really changing. So anyway, that was how I got to this place to be a PA. Um, I, was really, I knew I, I liked healthcare. I liked talking to people. Um, I knew I was really in, interested in women's health. It's mm -hmm. always been an area where I feel like I want women to be able to seek care in a um, safe, non-judgmental non space. And so um, those were the things that were my passion to become a PA. And a lot of benefit, you know, there's a lot of benefits to being a PA versus a physician that we all know. Um, I, you know, I had been out of school for a couple of years, so I was looking at how much student loans, how old I was going to be, and really what I wanted my life to be throughout my professional career in PA was just a better fit. So I'm so glad you brought that up because that's such a common question I get and such a common sticking point in the personal statements and in the, in the uh, interview everywhere is why PA and not doctor, because like the, the passion, the, the why, the motivation is essentially the same. And we know all those practical things, time in training, student loans, lateral mobility, all the hot button topics. But what I found a lot of people do is they kind of put down the physician profession in order to bolster the PA profession, which I don't think is right. So how do you square that? How do you square, I wanna practice medicine, but I don't wanna be a physician for X, Y, and Z, this is why PA. And what I tell people is just focus on the positives of PA and don't even mention all the other professions. What would you say? Um, I think physicians are great. We work alongside physicians. Yeah. I think there are additional pieces of that role that most PAs don't have to deal with. Mm -hmm. You're not the business owner. You're not the ultimate one making the decision yes. um, in many cases. And, you know, I think for a lot of physicians to have the boundaries in their professional and personal life, it's more challenging as a physician yes. as it is. But some want that. Some want to be the leader. Mm -hmm. Some want to be the 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 final decision maker. Mm -hmm. And there's there's nothing wrong with wanting that. And I think I think that's okay. And I think wanting the title of doctor and having that place on the healthcare team is okay too. Mm -hmm. And so if those things are important to you, and this is how I describe, if those things are important, there's nothing wrong with it, but maybe physician is the better way to go. Mm -hmm. If it's really your focus is, and you make more money, you make more money as a physician as well. So those, those things are all fine. And if, if that's the focus, then go the physician route. I think if your focus is providing care to patients, you're okay without having the title of doctor um, and being a member of the healthcare team. Um, and that will feed whatever professional um, motivations you have, then PA might be the route. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think they work together in such a collaborative way. Um, it's it's really those other pieces that I described that make the difference with the physician. Yeah. So I think that's kind of two topics we're on is how to write your personal statement for PA versus medical school, which both students will be watching this. And also how to choose which profession, because it's such a massive choice. You know, once you go down one road, it's kind of hard to go down the other road. It's possible, but it's hard. So you basically focus on the positive attributes and how your personality fits with either profession. So for PA, it would be providing care to patients, being compassionate for whatever reason you want to practice medicine. It might be teamwork. You might want to emphasize teamwork because two heads are better than one, three are better than two. 
And if you have like five PAs in a room, everyone's got various different experiences and together we can figure out so much more than we can by ourselves. Whereas the physicians usually a little more standalone and people come to them. Uh, so emphasizing teamwork would be good. Emphasizing working in multiple specialties with or without the buzzword of lateral mobility, but maybe just envision that for your life. Maybe I'd start on in primary care and then I would get motivated to do dermatology and maybe one day I'd work ortho and then I'd be working primary care again in my later years and I would know all this other stuff and be able to help my colleagues. Like that's a vision for a PA yeah. or a vision for an MD or a DO would be, I want to be so like, I want to understand so well this one particular field of medicine that people come to me, that I'm the authority on it, that I really truly feel like I have mastery and a sense of how this part of the body works and what I could do with it. Yeah. You know, because you're never going to have that as a PA. You're not going to go to residency for years where you're focused on the one narrow kind of aspect. And that's okay. Different professions. So different ways to write your essay, different things for you to just kind of contemplate. What do you want? You know, and also obviously there's the, the nuts and bolts things, how long you're in training, how young you are when you're making decent money. Do you yeah. want to make half a million or do you want to make, you know, one or 200 K like there, those are very big number things that you have to decide for yourself, decide and just go. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, loans are a real thing. Mm -hmm. So Honestly. how, how large are your loans going to be? Mm -hmm. And how is that going to impact your life as you get into your late twenties, thirties, forties? Um, it's, it's a factor to think about. Mm -hmm. based on what kind of work-life balance you're looking for. Everybody, 100% of the world wants work-life balance. Right. Um, what I think I see in PAs a lot of times is that their profession is absolutely important to them mm -hmm. and want to find a profession that feeds their drive for medicine, science, healthcare, making a difference. They don't want it to be the only thing in their lives mm -hmm. or the thing that takes over their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's okay. And I think, you know, I, that's, that's what I think. I think if I had to pick something, um, that's what, that I hear from applicants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want, it might be silly, but I always describe it as, do you want to do medicine as a job, kind of employee type of thing? You clock out, we're done, you go do something else. Or do you want to be medicine where you're a doctor? It's literally in your name. Well, and it's in your name as well, but you're a physician. You're a medical doctor. That is that is what you are. It's not just what you do for a living. It's what you are. And it's how society and people at the hospital see you. Yeah. How big of this, how much medicine do you want to be a part of your life? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, you stated it really very well. And and there's nothing wrong. The other thing is when it comes, getting back to the application, there's nothing wrong to having applied to, let's say you applied to medical school and you didn't get into medical school. Now you're thinking about PA school. That's okay. People change their minds all the time. Mm -hmm. It's explaining that evolution where sometimes I see applicants have a problem is they'll submit their MCAT scores so they'll be in their PA application, but they won't mention it at all. All they talk about is why they're in the PA. Yeah. So that's that's that mismatch that I'm talking about. Yeah. There's, there's no one way to be. Just be honest. <laughs> um, you know. So that's uh, I think that's fine. And we have applicants who have failed out of medical school. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But explain what was your journey to decide that you wanted to be a PA. And if you can present that in a way that shows that you have a true understanding of being in the PA profession versus this is what I'm doing because I failed out of medical school, sure. then, then why would we not consider that applicant? Yeah, I guess like read the room, have some social acuity and don't actually write in your personal statement, well, I really want to be a surgeon, but this is my backup. Uh, okay, let's maybe not say that. Uh, but let's say something along the lines of, you know, at one time in my life, I thought I wanted to do this. And then I met Jesse, the PA who changed my life. And I realized I wanted to do what she does, you know, yeah. find, find a good way to present it. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're, we're talking a lot around the essay. And I think mm -hmm. what's important to think about are a lot of the requirements that different PA schools have. Mm -hmm. um, 
the why that they have these requirements. So one of the things is academic preparation. So we talked about that. Some schools have minimum, some don't, but if, if that's a place of weakness, you want to, you want to make sure that you explain that. The reason for that is any person that we accept to our program and all programs, I'm sure, we want them to be successful. Correct. People put a lot of money on the line. They move across the country. They quit their jobs. There's no weeding out process for the vast majority of graduate programs. So we only want to accept those applicants who we think have the ability. So even if their grades don't show it, by the GPA, that we can see that they have the academic potential. All right, so that's, that's one piece. Patient care, why do we want that? We, we don't want it because we expect you have skills. And this applicants all the time, they, they uh, think we, we want, I can only speak for Rutgers. We wanna make sure that you are comfortable with a patient. The, the intimacy of patient care, of somebody sitting in a gown, um, that you're comfortable with bodily fluids and phlegm and vomit and, and, and talking about, you know, some of the most challenging things in patients' lives. So, right, there's that intimacy. That's why we want applicants to have patient care, not so that they know how to draw blood. We, we teach you all the skills you need to have, but it's that you know that this is really, really what you want to do. Shadowing. Why do we want you to have that? We, we, we accept, and I think most schools accept shadowing of nurse practitioner and physicians and PAs. We really want in-person PA shadowing. For that, re the reason for that is so that they know actually what a PA does versus a doctor versus a nurse practitioner. So they can start to tease out the differences that they notice. Mm -hmm. So all of these pieces, and then the, the fourth thing we think about is service. So I talked about that briefly, that it's part of our mission, our philosophy. There's a, a service requirement for students while they're here. And we really want to see, or we're looking, the most competitive applicants are those who have shown some commitment to service within their community. It doesn't have to be healthcare. In fact, I love when I see other things, whether it's um, the environment, beach cleanups, um, animal shelters, tutoring, uh, volunteering at their house of worship. All of these things make well-rounded, interesting people, right? So that's why we're, we're asking about service. So the why for each one of these things, the grades, the patient care, the shadowing, the service, that's really important to talk about within your application, mm -hmm. all right? So I always break down the application as what was your journey to decide you wanted to be a PA? You know, what's your passion, right? What are the things that you've done that have led to your passion and applying to PA school? So that's where you're going to touch on patient care, shadowing, service, or whatever. You're going to connect those dots for us, right? Those experiences that you've had have helped you in your journey to figure out this is what you want to do. It the the essay should not just be a regurgitation of your resume. Your, your, your resume has facts. It has bullet points and facts. Your essay is a reflection of those experiences, experiences or facts that drive your why. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense of what I'm trying very, to say? Very much so. So okay. the, the experiences section, the resume, those are the what. The essay is the how. Right. So the, the what is the how, I the why, the how, and bring it all together. Yes. How did it make you feel? Right. At why? the end of the yeah. at the end of the essay, if I feel excited to meet this person, mm -hmm. they're going to be recommended for an interview. Mm -hmm. So that's the key thing. If I if I just hear I I volunteered here, I did a medical mission, I shadowed here. That doesn't tell me any of the why. We already know that from the rest of your application. Exactly. So you hold an opportunity mm -hmm. to say, I did this medical mission, or I went and worked in Appalachia for a, a week or two weeks, and I was astounded how people in this country were living. I didn't know. 
it really opened my eyes to a different experience right here in the United States right. or whatever. Now I know when I see patients, I have a different perspective that I did not, I didn't have previously or, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's, those are the dots you want to connect. Mm -hmm. I don't know by reading your resume, the importance of anything on that resume. Right. Like the resume would say from September 1st through September 9th, I was in Appalachia West Virginia volunteering at this free clinic. What your essay is going to say is while I was doing that, I met Jeffrey, who was a, a welder and his hands have been hurting for years and he was crying because he can't support his family. And I literally told him about aspirin just for a little bit. And he's like, what's aspirin? And then I had a life changing moment going like this guy doesn't know what aspirin is. And, you know, maybe that'll give him an extra couple of years of income, you know, by being able to control his pain. Not that that's a likely example, but who knows, honestly, it could be. And that's, that's the how, that's the why, that's, and how did it make you feel? It made right. you realize that knowledge, even simple knowledge that to you is taken for granted, but can change someone's life. And that's how, what I want to do for the rest of my life is change people's lives with knowledge, AKA practicing medicine. That's what we do. Right. So connect and, the and dots. And, no. yeah. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. You're hitting on something else that I don't want to forget is that yeah. it's the why it's absolutely what we've, we've talked about is correct. Mm -hmm. The other thing about these experiences are interacting with people who are different than you. Mm. So that is really yeah. important to expand your experience outside your little microcosm of your family, where you go to school, who you spend time with. So you can use these experiences, patient care, mm -hmm. shadowing, service, to talk about those individuals that you've met along the way mm -hmm. that have changed your perspective a little bit yeah because that shows us that you're open you're you're open to change you're open to changing your opinion about something um and that you are malleable in understanding a patient's perspective because it always goes back to what we want to graduate at the at the end so I some and I gave that example of the the volunteering in Appalachia. It reminds me of an applicant I spoke to. They they grew up in in a certain county in New Jersey. They um, went to college in that county. Everything they did, it looked like they hadn't left one county in New Jersey mm -hmm. based on the application. Mm -hmm. And so I suggested to them that they step out of their comfort zone a little bit and find something to do. It doesn't, it could be either a job, it could be a volunteer experience or, or whatever, but work, work or volunteer with somebody, a group that's totally different. And so she, that's, she went to Appalachia and came back and said, that was life-changing yeah. for me. It's like, so, which is great. And then she wrote about that. It, it made a complete difference in her her application her reapplication the following year because you could see this person as more than just this monochromatic person from this one county i was going to use the word basic but monochromatic is much more professional yeah i was trying to think of the right word <laughs> the other thing yeah, I, like that. I think is really important is it is important to study really hard it's important to spend a lot of time in the library mm -hmm. and get good grades because that gives you the foundation to be successful in PA school. It also doesn't make you very interesting. And I think as a, you know, professional culture, PAs are pretty cool. Cool. You know, they, they're interesting. They are dynamic. Like this is what our profession is all about. So if all you can talk about is studying really hard and having your 3.9, it's just not that interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's the place where the patient care, the shadowing and the service choices you make um, matter. I'm thinking of a, a student who grew up down in the Jersey shore. Mm -hmm. He was a surfer and he was really into beach cleanup. Ooh. So he, he spoke about his beach cleanup and working side by side with people after Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. and how it impacted them and people who lost their homes that had nothing to do with medicine, but it doesn't matter. 
it showed a level of interest in helping the community, mm -hmm. listening, listening to people, listening to their struggles. These, that is an inherent quality that we want in any PA. So he achieved in his application, letting us know that he had that attribute in a way that had nothing to do with medicine. Yeah. So those, I, so anyway, so that's, that's what I have to say about that. With, with the surfer guy, that's actually very congruent because you could say, I grew up surfing. I like surfing the end, but I like surfing. I love the ocean. It makes me appreciate nature. I want to preserve nature. So I'm doing beach cleanups through these beach cleanups. I see all this trash on the, on the beach and I see needles. And then I realize some people must you know be using them. Yeah. Maybe like go and see, there's so many things you can write about, you know? So even if you grew up in the Jersey shore and you never left, but you like surfing and you like beach cleanup, that's, that's enough. That's really, really cool. And he's this, he's actually an applicant I mentored who said, I'm just a boring guy from New Jersey. Oh, you're not. So I said, what do you do? What do you like to do? And he's like, oh, I said, do you do anything fun? What, what, what do you do for fun? Mm -hmm. And he mentioned surfing. Right. So it piqued my interest because, you know, there's a lot of people who apply to PA school who aren't surfers. True. I was like, oh, he's got an angle. He's mm -hmm. a surfer. He's got an angle. He's got an angle. Yep. So then we talked about that. And then I said, this you should be writing about this. Right. And I, it, you know, whatever happens, I, I get all excited. We're like, look at this and you can, you can compare it or you can, you can illustrate your passion through X, Y, and Z. Oftentimes when I'm talking to them either on Zoom or in person, they'll be sitting, I'm like, start taking notes. This is good stuff <laughs> to, to write down. Everybody yeah. is unique. Everybody has an angle. They just have to yeah. spend a little time thinking about what that is. That's what you want to write about is think about putting yourself in a room of 20 people. What's different about you yeah. more than likely? Is it your Spanish speaking ability? Is it the fact that you surf? Nobody surfs. Not a lot of people surf. Right. It, you know, what is it? So like mine was the fact that I was in Russia. I was Russian, right? I spoke Russian. So my literal first line of my essay was in Russian. It was a quote. Yeah. And I'm like, do I expect somebody to understand that? No, they don't speak Russian, but I was trying to stand out. So what makes you stand out? Write about that the end, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's important. Uh, one thing I would really like to go back to, unless there's anything else on this topic you wanted to mention. Sure. I think that was valuable. That was very, very valuable. How do you stand out? What do you write about? Who succeeds and why? Um, we mentioned student loans when picking PA versus MD. Are you okay with a hundred to 200,000 in student loans? Or are you okay with 600,000? Because that's the reality for medical school. Um, the student loans, when you consider the difference in salary, technically, I don't think matter as much. But what matters is the risk. What if, for whatever reason, God forbid, you fail out after mm -hmm. a year, after six yeah. years of doctor training, medical doctor training? That's that's life changing. Uh, yeah. So what I want to talk about is people always say, how do I get in? And then they say, you know, maybe even how do I succeed? But nobody thinks about what if I fail? And yeah. both of us have seen people fail. So yeah. can we talk about some attributes that someone might have that leads to success in such a difficult training program and also some attributes that perhaps lead to failure? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, uh, as you know, we we talked about the first step is applying, yes. then the interview, mm -hmm. and then people get accepted. That's really just the beginning right? You have to then be successful. So I think the students that I think um, are most successful or the things that really set students up for success in PA school is A, again, that reflection. How strong is their foundational knowledge? So we're going by your GPA. It's the only objective measure we have. You have to think about how, how did you get those grades? So did you take an easy online class where you did almost nothing and you got an A? Well, you got into PA school, but the, the, the prerequisites are there. So we think that you know that information as a foundation to start. So I think being, being self-reflective and honest about your foundational knowledge, setting up your life for success. So I would say the majority of students that I have seen who have been unsuccessful once they're admitted, it's, it's almost never about intellect or potential or capability. It's outside challenges that, that get in their way. 
um, whether they are issues um, with expectations at home, um, response, family responsibilities at home, financial challenges, anxiety, um, something else that's, that's getting in the way. So what I always recommend to students is do everything that you can to be ready on day one. So PA school starts, there's no lead in. You, you sit in lectures and it, for most programs, it's Monday through Friday, multiple hours all day in class. And then you have to go home in the evening and study. So it sounds so simple, but it's amazing to me how many are challenged with this. If you're moving to a new state or a new town to go to PA school, mm -hmm. be moved in, be settled, have your new driver's license, <laughs> no, have your refrigerator filled with food. Think about how you're going to meal prep. You know, these simple things. But if you're commuting for the first two weeks, two hours, because you're School starts April, uh, August 15th, and your lease doesn't start till September 1st, you're two weeks behind already. So yeah. that gets that gets students into trouble. Um, the other thing that I think gets students into trouble is they wait too long to reach out for help. Mm. So every PA school, as I said before, we want 100% of students who start here on day one to graduate. Absolutely, we want zero attrition from the program. So there are so many services in place to help students, PA students at Rutgers and at most PA schools. We oftentimes find though, those students who might be challenged or having academic challenges, sometimes are afraid to expose themselves. They're struggling. I have a hard time. Um, we are, you know, from the culture I come from, it's just put your head down and move forward. We, it shows weakness to ask for help. And no, it's really short-sighted. These services are here to help the students. And so the successful students are the ones who have their life set up both in physical location, they've spoken with their family members, it, whether it's their parents, their romantic partnerships, their friends, to say, I'm not gonna be available all the time at night, their children sometimes, and find their way to create boundaries, whether it's stay at school and study so that when they go home, they don't have to think about it or come home and do what they need to do with their family and then sit down by eight o'clock at night and study or whatever it is, make that all work in their lives. Mm -hmm. Have those conversations with their family members and use the resources that are, that are available to them. They're, they, they exist there for a reason. Sure. Yeah, that, that's one piece of advice I definitely give people is if you have close people in your life, and not a lot of students do, but if you do, family, friends that you're very close with, obviously children, partner, spouse, they need to know that for the next two and a half years are going to be a selfish period in your life. Everything is about getting knowledge into your head, about you passing tests. You're not going to be there for them as much as they would expect and that you would like to be, but that's the only way to get through something this hard. It's yeah. just going to be kind of selfish and they have to understand that. Yeah. And communication, right? So it's yeah. communication with your loved ones, but it's communication with the program, your advisors, the program director. We don't know what's going on in your life unless you tell us. So right. we can't help you. We can't support what we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And it is always better to be proactive and share before you're failing or, um, before something gets out of control, mm -hmm. uh, always better to do it beforehand. And in fact, in some schools, it's even policies, policy drives that we need to know that you're failing or you're having some extraordinary circumstance before you fail the test. I, you know, I'll say in our program, based on school policies, if a student 
fails a course. Mm -hmm. The only way that they can even appeal is that there must be an extraordinary circumstance that we were aware of in writing prior to that event. Uh, yeah. So it mm -hmm. creates accountability on the student to be proactive. And so um, that I think, you know, some students are challenged with that for whatever reason. And um, so just communicate. I think it's better to over communicate. It doesn't mean that you have to share personal um, parts, personal components that you're not comfortable with, mm -hmm. but it's important to share something so that they can understand, you know, what your challenges are. We're all here to help. That's a really good point. Um, I wish I had this uh, this talk with you before my PA school because I definitely had some things come up um, on a small example. You know, some financial challenges. Like I, I had the GI Bill paying for my PA school. Yeah. But unfortunately, my school has a, a five week Christmas break during which time I'm not in class, so I'm technically not receiving funding for housing. So how was I going to pay for rent? Um, and so I brought this up to a few people in the program and they're like, oh, there's this grant, by the way, through the college. And, you know, I took advantage of it. Yeah. And of course, I once I started working, I donated to that grant because they helped me so much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just simple stuff like that. Uh, totally different example during this, just before the second year, uh, the clinical year started, I had some family stuff going on that was extraordinarily stressful. And I did not mention it to anyone until it became a problem. And at that point, it was already a problem. You know, so I mean, thank God we got through that, but we we may not have, and I may not be sitting here today because of it. So, yeah. you know, it's something to be discussed as soon as it becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the way that I always uh, counsel students is mm -hmm. all of these supports are in place for you. We want you to be successful. We can be flexible with you, but you you have to pass. Mm -hmm. You ultimately are responsible for meeting the outcomes for every course, which means a passing grade. And we will not pass you through mm -hmm. if you don't pass, because at the end, we have some accountability to your right. ability to provide care. Right. And so whatever we can do to help sort out those barriers, mm -hmm. because everybody who comes here has the potential. So right. let us help you figure out ways to get over those barriers. The other thing that I think um, is really important is anxiety management. Mm -hmm. So we all know anxiety brings out the worst in people. Sure. So for, for everybody, um, know what your anxiety triggers are and what your response to anxiety is. Do you get angry? Do you cry? Do you crawl into a corner and not talk to anybody? Mm -hmm. Whatever stress you've had before PA school, it's probably gonna be amplified while you're here. And so have a little grace with yourself to identify those things and grace with those around you, your fellow classmates, your faculty, the staff. We all have competing things that are causing stress. And so the students who are most successful do a good job of having things set up for themselves. They're good and they have strategies to manage their anxiety mm -hmm. and they show a little bit of flexibility and let things roll off their back a little bit. No matter how much planning any PA program does, things happen. People cancel, lectures get canceled last minute, things, schedules change, you know, exam, online exams don't download properly or you know, all of these different things happen all the time. The students who are able to keep their eye on the larger picture of this is, I'm getting a good education, I'm getting the knowledge and skills I need to be a good healthcare provider, then the rest of it kind of falls away. Those who, those students who get really caught up on, um, you know, a lecturer who might say one thing that they don't like or is 20 minutes late, some can just perseverate into this negative place. And that really is expending a lot of energy that's that's useless. That's a really good point. It's uh, it's kind of like a stick to itness sort of a quality. 
because if you think school is bad with all the issues that they have, you just, you wait until you start working with an EMR um, yeah. and your license and your patient's life is on the line while the EMR is malfunctioning and IT isn't answering and you're like, you right. just stick to it and you get through it. You know, you figure right. it out. Right. Uh, but yeah. school will definitely have a lot of challenges. There will be emails at 1130 at night saying, hey, by the way, there's more material for tomorrow's exam. Uh, yeah. It shouldn't, but it does. Yeah. Uh, there is going to be a lecture is going to be late. A lecture is going to be anxious and go off on a tangent for 40 minutes and then test you on things that they didn't have time to get to. It's yeah. just there. Anytime you're dealing with humans, it's just going to be problems. But you're still responsible for what you're responsible for, despite all the issues. So. Right. And, you know, there's there's such a um, emphasis now on on um, provider burnout. Yes. So we know it's a true problem of provider burnout. So our job as an educational program is to help students start building those skills in place to build that resilience, that grit or whatever word you want to use so that once they become a PA and a provider, those skills have been established to help them to avoid burnout. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's in any program, there's two ways that you can help with wellness and self-care and avoiding burnout at the educational level. One is create a program that's less stressful. So figure out ways to make things less stressful. So we think about that. Um, and agree with students that PA school is inherently stressful. Mm -hmm. It is. It's hard. You got to figure it out. And we're here to help you figure that out and build those, build those skills. Yeah. So to summarize, as far as things that kind of make things difficult for students, maybe lead to failure and conversely lead to success. First things first, just being prepared, having your needs met, having your knowing where your meals are coming from, knowing where you're sleeping, preferably within an hour of the school, just having just all that set up, how you're going to pay for it, student loans, uh, what, whatever you're going to do, just have your life set up to your support systems and also having your support systems understand that you're going to be kind of absent for a little while. Uh, you're not going to have much time. And then three, just kind of expect challenges and kind of let them roll off your back as much as possible and understand that it's just part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, back to that, when we're looking for it in the application, mm -hmm. see it all, it's all full, full circle here. It is. You know, that introspection that we look for in the application is that same introspection and self-awareness that we're looking for before and during PA school. Mm -hmm. What are those areas where that get in my way? Mm -hmm. As much as it laying in your bed trying to study because you fall asleep. So, you know, that's not really good, but that's what you do. Um, or you realize you procrastinate in X, Y, and Z way, or, you know, whatever those barriers are, you have to identify them and say, all right, I can make changes up to this amount. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if you're, if you have children or you, you're in a relationship, you have parents, you're going to still see your children and you're I hope so. Ones, absolutely. And we encourage that. But figuring out the balance is the piece that one needs to do before they get to PA school to really alleviate a lot of a lot of stress. So yeah. it's it's it all comes back to that introspection and um and and self awareness. Yeah. And I think that that's a really good thing to include in your personal statement. And especially if the school kind of like Rutgers does, gives you a chance to explain any shortcomings. Uh, so, you know, like green flags, red flags, you got a red flag behind you, but that's not what I'm talking about. Red flags isn't like things that are worrisome. Green flags are things that like say good things about you. I right. think the ultimate green flag for somebody who might have had poor grades at one time is not just saying I brought my grades up or I got motivated and I did. Tell me specifically exactly how, like you brought up studying in bed versus studying upright at a desk, yeah. just that little example. And then I wasn't falling asleep anymore. And then I got through my studies and, oh, just making that small change changed everything. Talk yeah. about that. Tell me that, that exact thing. Yeah. You know, 
I mean, I think it's to say I, I was, it can be that granular in some of these explanations. Mm -hmm. I was studying on my bed. I realized I was just studying facts, but not understanding mm -hmm. the concepts behind the facts. So I went to the campus tutoring place and I worked one-on-one -on -one for six months and I learned strategies of X, Y, and Z and I used them and you can see they made a positive impact in my grades. Yeah. That's um, when, when they, when applicants write that, that's, that's great. And I would say even more specific than that, I would say like nuts and bolts, exactly what did they tell you? Did they say you're putting too many words on your note cards and they're not simple enough? Something that simple. Did they say, you know, memorize things, acronyms and lists, as opposed to, you know, just trying to memorize a list without an acronym that made a difference. Exactly. What was it? Because yeah. then I know reading that, like, okay, you learned that and you improved and you were able to overcome a challenge. So when a challenge inevitably comes up in PA school, you're the kind of person that's going to find a way. Right. And, and I'll go with the caveat of having flexibility in your study strategies. Mm -hmm. So if you keep going down the same road, you're going to end up at the same destination. Yeah. So if you start PA school and whatever worked in undergrad, you do have your first cycle of exams and you do poorly, then you need to be open-minded to change your study strategies mm -hmm. because you might need to do something different and you have to have that flexibility to try different things, yeah. reach out to the office of success or your advisor or whoever it is mm -hmm. and talk to your classmates and be open to trying something different. Mm -hmm. So I think, we see that flexibility in the application, but expect that same kind of a flexibility when they're here. And what works in one class might be different than another class. Yeah. So being, I keep, I feel like I'm redundant, but being self-reflective, yes. see where you are at any given time. What am I doing well? Where, where is there room for, for growth and opportunity for improvement and how much change can I reasonably make? And, and be honest with yourself about that too. I see students who come in with these, I'm going to study eight hours a day after I've sat in class for eight hours and I'm going to study all weekend. And I look at their schedules and I say, this is not possible. No. What you're saying. So let's be reasonable. What are the things that feed you? Is it exercising? Is it watching a TV show that's from seven to eight at night? Is it scrolling on social media? What is What do you need for your downtime? And put that into your schedule. But don't block out eight hours if you're really not going to study for eight hours, because then what happens is you don't reach your goal, you feel bad about it, and then it becomes this, this cycle. Yeah. So all of that introspection and... Um, reasonableness is important. And I just want to say too, we've talked about success in PA school and most people who get into PA school have been high achieving their entire life. Sure. They have been working hard. It's all about the grades. And I, and I said this to a faculty member the other day, they apply to PA school, the grades, the grades, the grades, the mm -hmm. patient care, the community service, all of this stuff. Then they get into PA school and we say, just pass, just meet, you know, whatever grades you want to keep your anxiety. We've created the monster of students <laughs> who think they need to get nineties right. on every exam to be a good PA. And so we're actually addressing that a little bit of like, how do we segue that? Cause it's, we're a little hypocritical, right? You needed, you needed these high grades to get here, but now we're saying, you can let some of that go because it's PA school is about getting the knowledge and skills, but finding that balance for yourself so that you are successful so that you can be a good empathetic provider at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it's way more than just about the grades while you're in PA school. So yeah. don't get focused on that piece. I guess. I would totally agree with that. I guess I can't think of anything else as far as advice for success versus failure. I mean, that's, that's essentially going to cover it, I think. Yeah. 
Um, any specific examples that you're comfortable sharing of a, like a student that, you know, maybe things that you know about them that they did in their lives where they just shot up and they had great success and maybe someone that did not have such great success? Um, yeah, I mean, I can think of a ton of applicants who had certain challenges in their lives mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we, we always, you know, we, we get 1500 applications for 50 spots, right? Okay. So we get way more applications, way more people who are qualified mm -hmm. than we have seats. What is that? 3%? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty. That's, like Princeton. that's, that's yeah. better than Princeton for undergrad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's competitive guys. Yeah. But like you said, we're looking for these other attributes. So mm -hmm. your GPA is just one thing. So we're looking for those students who have figured out they we've seen the words I would use for students who are higher risk or have some previous challenges in their academic mm -hmm. background. We're looking for those students who have shown a level of um, of evolution, mm -hmm. a level of maturity, taking responsible and have put in the work to then set themselves up for success. Mm -hmm. So students that I think about who have, you know, sometimes we have students who were the highest achieving in their high school, and then they went to college and their grades were really low. So they'll talk about the lack of mentoring, the lack of foundational preparation that they had in undergrad that impacted their grades. So I'm thinking about a student who really spoke about not having any any mentors mm -hmm. in her family, really at school. Nobody encouraged her to even go to college. And so she was fundamentally doing it all herself. Mm -hmm. And so she arrived and um, she was somebody I met actually through a recruitment uh, activity. She came in, we talked about what is she gonna need to do? What are the barriers? What does she need to do for success? She set herself up with a tutor right away. She, um, we, there's mental health counseling that's available. She set up monthly meetings with her advisor even though she didn't need to. So she set all of these things up and was ultimately successful. Um, um, so, you know, I think, I don't know if that really answers. No, the it does. Sometimes it's, it's, whatever were your barriers, you have to figure out ways to overcome those barriers or you're gonna end up in graduate school with the same outcome or challenges that you had in undergrad proactively. I, I really like that that person okay. set all those things up ahead of time. Yes. Knowing these are my sticking points. This is what made the difference. Like I had a lot of mentorship and support in high school and I killed it. And then in undergrad, I didn't. And I know that's important. So I want to succeed here. I'm going to set that all up ahead of time. Yeah. That's fantastic. Management of anxiety is, I just can't state that enough. How important to maintain doing those things in your life that matter to you, whether it's going to your house of worship, exercising, meal prepping, hanging out with friends, you just can't be on 24 seven. It's just not realistic. No way. So allowing yourself that um, space. I'm thinking of a student who came to see me last semester. Her level of anxiety was so high achieving student, had like a 3.8, GPA from undergrad, was an athlete, um, always doing all the right things, getting amazing grades, and was talking to me about her stress level and how she can't allow herself to get under a 90. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not a therapist, I don't try to play one, but I encourage her to really talk to somebody because there's some underlying issue there mm -hmm. that was getting in her way that really needed to be addressed. So while she was getting good grades, if you're crumbling while you're doing that, it's just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so put those resources in in place. I think are really the the most communication, putting re using resources and staying flexible 
and still allowing yourself to have some fun. There is fun in PA school. And I say that on the very first day of orientation. Um, I'm thinking of a group. We had a, we had a cohort of students who were a bunch of students who were from out of state mm -hmm. and they made a commitment to each other that once a month they were going to do something fun on a weekend. So, and they weren't allowed to not do it. They had to commit. Uh -huh. I like that. In New Jersey, we're an hour, you know, we're less than an hour into Manhattan. We're less than an hour to Philadelphia. So every month they would go pumpkin picking. They would <laughs> go eat something touristy or something mm -hmm. very, you know, New Jersey. And by the end of school, they had built in some wellness and self-care. They had this camaraderie of friends who might not have otherwise connected in the class, but being out of state is what created it. And they made the most of being in PA school in our location. So I think all of those things lend lend themselves to being successful. Yeah, I, I wish self-care was mentioned more, but yeah. trying to get some sleep, at least taking a walk, getting a little bit of exercise. Yeah. Because in my PA school, I'm sure it's the same in yours and, and all of them, but you're basically in the same room for nine hours a day, every day in the same seat. And what I couldn't understand is when we had like 45 minutes or an hour for lunch in between classes, people stayed in their seats. Like, I don't get that. How do you do that? Like, no. I had to get outside. I took a walk. I went to the gym. I at least went to the cafeteria and got fries. I don't care. Like, I did something to not be in that room because it was driving me nuts. But yeah. some people just stayed there and studied. And yeah. I just, I can't imagine that's healthy for you physically, mentally. I, I just can't imagine that. Yeah. So there's, Schedule in something for yourself, whether it's even just a walk around the block. Just, just go do it. Yeah, you, know, you can't be all nighters regularly. You cannot. Oh, yeah. I don't know anybody who can live and function well on two to three hours of sleep, no. and no. really retain information the, the way they need to. Students, a lot of times, they're challenged and they they don't they don't want to listen. They, I'm different, and I. I just, what happens oftentimes then they get burned, right? They don't do well or they're falling asleep in class. So then they get called in about, you know, not being professional sure. or, you know, whatever it is. And I think being open to trying different strategies of sleep, studying, when you go to bed, having good sleep hygiene, it all sounds so basic for us, but it really, it's fundamental. Eat right, move your body, Mm -hmm. sleep, talk to the people that you love, have something outside of PA school. Yeah. If, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like when you're talking to your patients, right? It, we could get rid of 70% of illnesses if people had good, healthy habits. So why don't we all just eat right, exercise and sleep mm -hmm. right? Because there's all these outside influences and barriers to us doing it. PA yeah. students are no different than that. Yeah, that's so I'm in urgent care currently. And one sticking point is in urgent care is as soon as someone gets the sniffles, it's a sinus infection and they want their augmentin or they want their ZPAC yeah. and explaining to them, like, you need to take two days off. You've been burning the candle at both ends. You need to hydrate, sleep and saltwater gargle and your little cold's going to go away. Antibiotics ain't going to fix it. Yeah. So literally just take care of you just for a day. Yeah. And you'd be shocked how fast your body bounces back and then you can retain knowledge and you just everything's better. Yeah. And I think for PA students, build a collaboration with your advisor or yeah. other faculty member. You know, the person who I said was sleeping two hours a night, I I got him to agree to texting me once a week, <laughs> in the, you know, to get past this where I asked him to commit to sleeping four hours a day, four oh. hours. Let's do baby steps, four hours. And on Friday, I want you to tell me if you did it. Mm -hmm. And that that was not a lot of time on my part. It was oh. just a conversation. He did it because he knew he had to email me at the end of the week. So if I if that little piece, if I need to do that to help a student or another faculty member needs to help somebody be accountable, we're all here to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just fundamental here at Rutgers. I'm I'm sure most PA programs are like that, but mm -hmm. it's out and saying this is the challenge what can we do together and working as a team sure to to help a student be successful it's kind of like the aspirin example from appalachia like i didn't know i could take those little pills and my hands don't hurt 
it's like it's, sometimes it takes an objective person, an objective bystander to tell you, hey, by the way, sleeping two hours a night might be your issue. It's not your study skills. It's yeah. not your on key deck. It's the fact that you're not sleeping. Yeah. So, and so that's why you talk to other people. You talk to your advisor. You talk to the program lead, your fellow students. And when that comes out that, hey, by the way, I'm doing all this. Why isn't it working? Well, how much are you sleeping? Yeah. Not. Right. Okay. Didn't think that could be an issue, but let's let's fix that first, and then your brain will work a little better. Hydrate, exactly. walk. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And cool. but just one other thing that I think is paramount because we talked about it in the application about the why. Yeah. I think it's really important to hold on to that why while you're in PA school. So it's yeah. easy for students they get to PA school and it's test after test and lecture and and responsibility and obligation and they just gets in the weeds mm -hmm. right it's important to remember the why yeah so when you're having those moments in pa school where you're just feeling stressed out beaten down whatever emotion mm -hmm. go back to your why go back and read the application and and what you wrote in your essay about your why mm -hmm. um go volunteer for a couple of hours on a saturday I'm glad you said that yeah. and then they remember their why Mm -hmm. we, we have a clinic that we that's affiliated that is run by the PA faculty and our medical director here at Rutgers. And first year students spend time going to the clinic as first years. And then um, clinical our clinical students go and provide care. Sure. And we just precept them. A hundred percent of first year students, you know, they're like, oh, I got to go to the clinic, but I have a test yeah. in three days. Yep. Walk out of the clinic. And they're like, this is why I came to PA school. Yes. This is what I care about. It it rejuvenates them. And so whether you know you have an affiliated clinic with your program or whatever it is, go do the beach cleanup, go to your house of worship, feed that piece of the why you want to be a provider. And that will help you get through the challenging times with exams and mm -hmm. and obligations and everything else you have to do with PA school. It's amazing how fast that supercharges you yeah. and also how, so like we all go into becoming a PA because we want to interact with people. We want to help people. We want to know things. The only part of those needs that the school is filling is maybe knowing things. And then you still never feel like you know anything because there's so much new information. You don't feel like any of it's stuck, even though it has. Uh, but I realized that also like kind of halfway through is I am here because I like to serve. I like to help. I like to collaborate. And I like to kind of use what I know to help people. That's why I wanted to be a PA, but I'm not doing any of that in school. And so, you know, hence this whole channel and this whole mentorship business was born. And like, so if you ask somebody like, what's the advice on how to get through this tremendous amount of work? If I tell you more work, start a project, go do something, spend your time not working on school. They'd be like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. And then they do it and then they realize now I have this endless amount of energy because now like my needs are met, I'm fulfilled. I feel like I'm doing this for a reason and I'm not just grinding, 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 you know, yeah. with no payoff. Yeah. Um, so yeah. You know, there's something that I that I just thought about that, you know, kind of with the challenges and barriers that sometimes yeah. students have to, and, or a tip is we always say you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. Healthcare, you feel uncomfortable, you feel incompetent all the time oh. as a student as a new grad it doesn't matter if you've been in the profession for 5 10 20 years mm -hmm. you have to be comfortable in being com you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable right. of not knowing of saying i don't know it it's a reflection of you not knowing it's not a reflection of who you are as a person yes and i think a lot of times students have a hard time separating their discomfort or not knowing something perfectly and thinking it's a reflection of them versus it's just about the thing, if, if that makes sense. So I think those students who can say confidently, I'm a good person, I have great potential as a provider, I'm just not very good or competent at doing X. I'm not good at doing the neurophysical exam. Right. You just have to learn the more you do it. So come to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think is a really important piece as well. I'm really glad you said that because I think the most important thing, particularly a PA knows is what they don't know. 
yeah. when to ask for help from your supervising, from another provider. Like, I don't know this as well as I should. Let me ask somebody. And if you're humble enough to do that, patients will be so happy with you. Yeah. Like, I think patients are most happy with me when I say, honestly, I have no idea. I can yeah. tell you it doesn't look like this, this, and this. I don't think it's this terrible thing. But what that rash is, I have no clue. So it looks a little bit like this. We're going to try this. If this doesn't work, we'll try something else. Worst case scenario, go to dermatology. You know, it's they people appreciate that you understand what you don't know. Yeah. But you have thing. to have the confidence. You have the conf the overall confidence yes. to say that. Yes. So you need to have you need to confidently say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a key piece so that your overall how you see yourself as a person, mm -hmm. you see yourself in a confident way so that you yes. can confidently say, I don't know. Yes. Do, do you know, even in the example you just gave for yourself, mm -hmm. if you didn't feel confident in who you were as a provider, then not knowing that one fact, it would take on a whole different um, level for you and your demeanor would be not confident to the patient. Right. And the patient then would lose trust. Right? They wouldn't feel good about it. Right. So I think the every person gets into PA school because they earned it. Mm -hmm. Not because we made a mistake. They're, they, they got in, their application was good, their interview was great, and they earned their spot in the class. Mm -hmm. So be confident in that and be confident you're here to learn. You're not expected to know everything. And, and the students who are able to find that, that understanding of themselves Mm -hmm. um, tend to do better. Yeah. Like it's not just because you didn't memorize every component in the neuro exam, which is a beast. I do it every day now. So it's, it's a nothing burger, but when you're learning it, it's a beast. Uh, and just because you haven't gotten it yet. And even if your friends have got it, it doesn't mean you're not going to be a PA or you're going to be a bad provider or you're stupid. It's just yeah. going to take for you, whatever reason, for whatever reason, this thing is hard for you to learn. It's going to take a little extra time and practice. That's it. There's nothing wrong with you personally for not knowing it right this minute. Yeah. And go back to those other attributes, full circle that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Humanistic patient care, empathy, um, somebody who, who has conversations in a non-judgmental way. Yes. All of those, when, when you see somebody, if, if you're in the emergency room and you were in a car accident and your child was injured, mm -hmm. What you want is a provider who's sitting there who shows empathy, understanding. Mm -hmm. If they don't know every single fact, that those can be looked up, right? Mm -hmm. But are you that empathetic provider who right. can be there for patients in those really challenging moments? Those are the most important thing about being in PA school. Mm -hmm. Grace for your patients, grace for yourself. It's personality it's um, it's outlook, it's who you want to be. Those are the most important pieces in PA school because the knowledge and skills can be learned. Right. So. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to, this is like a super quick topic, um, but you said like an hour ago, I want to say, uh, about like taking hard classes versus maybe you took something online and it was easy and you got an A. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a question I get quite a bit. Is community college okay? Is online okay? I usually tell people not more than like two or three. The bulk should be from a brick and mortar four year institution, but in seat, you know, professor, lab, hands on. What is your opinion? So our opinion is um, we want the bulk of courses to be at a four year university. Yes. Um, so that's, we accept classes from community college. We accept okay. online classes. You know, if it's, if somebody was a, you know, biology major undergrad and they need to go take one or two prerequisites and they take them online or they take them in the community college, that's fine. Yeah. Um, what I think becomes more challenging is if students, the, we found that this isn't across the board, but generally the rigor is harder at a four-year university. So yeah. students come in with a better foundational knowledge. So the more classes that you take um, outside of that, that 
that space, the less confident we can be about your educational knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, that's, that's what we think we're, we're trying to track now online courses. There's a huge disparity. You could take a really excellent, rigorous course online, or you could take a course that is not rigorous. Right. So we're starting to track this since COVID mm -hmm. to see how many classes were taken online versus in person. You can't even tell because a lot of undergraduate institutions have online courses, right? So it just has the courses from X university. It doesn't, it's not designated it's online or in person. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we're, you know, we're following trends right now. So ideally, like we said, brick and mortar for your university, just like you said. The other thing that we consider is how many sciences you took at one time, because each semester is 18 credits of hard classes here. So if you're taking one class at a time, because you're working full time, um, you've shown and you get an A, you've shown you when you take one class at a time, you can get an A. How does that translate to when you're here taking a bulk of classes? Right. It doesn't, it's not a deal breaker, but it's something we look at how an applicant takes their courses in addition to what they took, in addition to where they took it, in addition to what the grade was. Yeah. I think when people, <coughs> excuse me, when people are asking this question, I think the best thing for them to do is to put themselves in your shoes. You know, would I, applicant A, applicant B, applicant A took one class at a time, like you said, or they took like two classes online and one class, you know, in person. Applicant B took four or five classes at a time, two or three of which are science with a lab all at the same time. They both have the same GPA. Who do you choose? Right. Obviously applicant B. Right. Because, because we partial. want we want them to be successful. Yes. So, you know, sometimes we I've suggested if somebody's let's say they're right out of college, they're still living at home, mm -hmm. they're working as a scribe or, you know, getting some health care and this comes up, are they in a financial position where they could decrease the work hours that they're doing and take more clothes? classes sure. for one to two semesters. Not everybody can do that depending no. on what their financial situation is. But um, that's helpful, especially for those students who have the lower um, GPAs. Yeah. Now, if you have somebody who has a 3.8 GPA, whether they take a few classes online or community college, they already have a track record of doing well sure. in their science classes. So it's always hard. It's this is that gestalt holistic review that we do of the application where we look at this. The other question that I get a lot is, should I repeat courses? Mm, yeah. And my answer used to always be, well, what you've shown is you can do well when you take a class twice. <laughs> so you don't get to take classes twice in PA school. Nope. I have a caveat to that now is that, you need foundational knowledge for course one to do well in course two. Sure. So sometimes it's helpful to take a class again so that you have the foundational knowledge so that you have the information when you arrive at PA school. Uh, so if you're doing it for a reason other than just fixing your GPA, if you just want to get the knowledge from OCHEM, maybe yeah. retake it then. But otherwise, it would, be, it would look a lot better if you took a different chemistry course. I I mean, that's what that we think. We'd rather have you take an upper level science course and do well in it mm -hmm. versus take your bio one. You got a C in bio one. Right. So repeating bio one, who it doesn't matter right. really for us. Yeah. As long as you have enough foundational knowledge, it's right. better to take an upper level genetics course or biochemistry or micro, you know, biology or, or something else that's a higher level to show that you can do well at a higher at a higher level. I'm so glad you said that because that's the advice I always got. And I got so much pushback from people saying, no, you should repeat courses. So in CASPA, they all average out. So it doesn't matter whether it's another science course or you right. repeat it, that D is still going to be there. 
whether you right. take it or not. So it would look much better to me, again, applicant A versus applicant B. Both of them have a 3.2 GPA. Both of them got a D in organic chemistry their sophomore year. Applicant A retook organic chemistry, got an A. Applicant B took cell bio and got an A. Totally new course, even harder, upper level. Both worth the same amount of credits, but I like applicant B better. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, again, it goes back to that why. Why do we even care about GPA? We care about GPA because we want the person to, we want to set up anybody that we accept into the program for success. Yes. So we want to accept people who have a track record where we think that they can handle 18 credits a semester of upper level graduate level science. Yeah. And so the candidate two that you described gives us more confidence about their ability to manage that versus applicant A that you described. It's not about the most competitive, the highest GPA. It's, are you capable of doing the work? Yes. Can you do this? Because that has to be baseline, no matter how many patient care hours you have. If we don't think that you have the academic um, abilities to be successful, mm -hmm. you could have 10,000 patient care hours. It's still going to be a challenge to get into PA school. So you, yeah. you need, that's a fundamental thing to think about. Yeah. And it's not over if your GPA happens to be whatever it might be, but you have to in some way, shape or form prove that you can handle it, whether it be a master's, a post back, and other bachelor's, whatever yeah. it may be, just be in the classroom for a number of credits, preferably at least 12, hopefully 16 or more, where you're getting a good GPA for that time. If you can do that, that's really all it takes to prove that. Yeah. yeah. And then as we talked about, connect the dots, circle back, mm -hmm. point it out. Yes. Point out, you know, if you if you do a job or a, a great explanation. Therefore, I spoke to these people. I took a hard look in my grades and realized I really needed to prove that to myself and to admissions committees that I was capable. Therefore, I took three classes at one time. Mm -hmm. or whatever you did make it easy right write it write it out yeah. because we're reading 1500 applications and we're we're like so many programs connect the dots spoon feed us what your greatness and what you've done mm -hmm. because if you don't then you're relying on us to critically think and connect the dots for all the pieces of your application and those who make it easy for us to understand and make it completely clear are more competitive. Yeah. I mean, can't really say it any more clearly than that. We'll see if, if people do it. Yeah. But that, yeah, like have some empathy and some just understanding for the people that you're applying to, like people yeah. in Dr. Palferman's position, they're reading a ton of these applications out of the goodness of their heart and because they want to find someone who's super qualified they don't have to read all of them. They could just like cut off the bottom 90% be like by GPA, that's it. We're accepting Tom Tepner son. Right. That's it over. They don't do that. They take it upon themselves to read every word of every application, which is a tremendous amount of work because they want to find that good person who can handle a lot. So be that person, help them out, you know, yeah. make it easy for them to understand why it's you that they want to interview. Yeah. yeah. We've been talking for a long time, yeah. but I, I, um, a couple other things that I think are important is if the school asks you why that school specifically, mm -hmm. go to their website and look at the things that they highlight about the school. Yes. A bad answer. The first thing that you say for any school should not be, you're 20 minutes from my home and I can live at home <laughs> with my parents. So don't talk about that? No, you can, you can talk about location. But it shouldn't be the driving force. Do I want to feel like at Rutgers, the only reason somebody wants to come here mm -hmm. is because it's near their parents' house or their father went to the school? Mm -hmm. No. I want you to, to align with our mission. So read our mission. Look at the things that we talk about that are really important to us. And then talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Be honest. But what are the things? Why are you applying here in the first place? What are the things that got you excited to even apply to any particular school? Write about those things, mm -hmm. whether it's the curriculum, the outlook, the pants scores, the service, the clinical placements, whatever it is, 
talk about that before geography. You could talk about that, but it, it shouldn't be the first thing. Yeah. I, uh, I'm going to admit, admit a mistake here because I've got that question a number of times. I really want to go to the school because it's close to my parents' house. And, you know, people ask me, is that okay to write about? And until today, I've always said, yeah, absolutely. Focus on how important family is and the support structure and how it helped you, you know, succeed in undergrad. Um, so maybe, maybe I shouldn't give that particular advice. Maybe I should say focus on the mission and values. I think it's not bad it's not a bad answer. It shouldn't be the only answer. Correct. Think about the yeah. faculty and staff who are made it their professional career to create a quality program. That does not have to do with the geography and their parents' home, right? So you're speaking to the faculty that that are want to admit you. Mm -hmm. So we want to know the things that we think are great that we're creating, spending our blood, sweat, and tears to create this yeah. quality experience, that's why you want to come here, whatever that is. Now, it's okay to say whatever that is. You're educated. You've been around for 40 years. We like the longer structure. We like how you have clinical placements all over the state. Those are all great answers. In addition, it's within commuting distance from my parents' house, so I'll have to take less loans. I won't have the pressure, financial burdens, which means I'll be able to focus on my education. Yeah. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But the answer just can't be, my father went to this school 40 years ago, so I think it might be good. Because it, 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 yeah. it, it's all in the wording and the, and the, the drive behind whatever the wording is. So it's okay to mention, but definitely mention the attributes of the program more. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll just say we hear a lot from, you know, we, New Jersey is a very diverse mm -hmm. community here. Rutgers is one of the most diverse universities in the country. So we oftentimes have people say they want to come to Rutgers because of the diversity mm -hmm. and the opportunity to work with very diverse patient populations. So that has a little bit to do with geography. We we don't control the diversity of New Jersey, right. but that is a totally reasonable answer about something that really has nothing to do with us. So, yeah, a piece of advice I got from actually another dean of admissions, uh, your program director. She was a dean of admissions at a PA program. She said it's like you're interviewing your best friend. You know that that's the advice that she gave, and that all kind of came full circle just now because. If someone says, yeah, I'm only friends with you because you live next door. You're like, well, yeah. that's cool, great. I can't wait to be friends with you. The second tier of that would be, I'm only friends with you because of who you know, would be like kind of the, the geography aspect. The third one would be, I love everything about your personality. You're a great person. You're generous. You're, you know, all these things that you're actually proud of yourself about. So be that third person, which makes sense, which makes me feel bad for giving bad advice to those people that ask me. Um, because it, you, they really should focus on the school, the attributes, things like that, not the, the geography so much. I, you know, I think it's not terrible advice. It's just how are you going to make your application the most competitive? Correct. Right? So there are people who might write something about, you know, living 20 minutes, being 20 minutes from the parents' house. The rest of their application is amazing. They still get an interview and they come yeah. here and they're personable. It's, it's, it's not it's a deal breaker. It's, there's no one little thing like this. Right. But it's that, not no, it's I just fire. think if you're really focused or passionate about particular schools, mm -hmm. um, focus on the things that, that the school cares about as well. Couldn't agree more. Um, one thing, we didn't talk about interviews at all. You, can I talk about that just ever so? You're going to... Yeah. So you you had asked about interviewing and yes. how to prepare for the interview and and um, advice. Mm -hmm. So I think a fundamental piece about the interview is really be yourself, be authentic, be honest. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you want to prepare. So there's going to be obvious questions that you're going to be asked you're going to be asked by every program some kind of, so why do you want to be PA? While that might be already in your essay, they want to hear you talk about it. Mm -hmm. They might ask you specific components from your essay that you wrote about 
um, about wanting to be a PA and they might ask you a specific thing. So preparation, I think, is important. There's a ton of online resources and videos about questions that might be asked. And so I think it's helpful to do a little background and, and look at what some kinds of questions might be that you might be asked about. Mm -hmm. Practice with a friend, say the words in front of the mirror, say the words out loud while you're um, driving in the car because thinking your answers versus actually verbalizing them can be two very different things, especially when one gets nervous. Practice, practice, practice. Exactly. Yeah. At the same time, don't practice so much you become like a robot. <laughs> so what happens sometimes is applicants will come in and we know they're, they're nervous. They come in and they're very rigid and you ask, we ask a question of the applicant and it's almost like I can see the computer in their brain saying, oh, <laughs> answer number 47. Yeah. Spit out an answer that really doesn't answer the question, but uh -huh. they need to say that point. Yes. So that comes across as authentic, inauthentic. Mm -hmm. So listen to the answer, you know, l listen to the question. Think about it for a second. Process what they're asking and then try to give an articulate response. There's, mm -hmm. I know people say this, there's really no wrong answers. Um, it just needs to come across as honest. And whatever your honest, whatever your answers are, need to match what's written in your application. So I think that's key. Um, there, most schools are not looking for your skill. They're thinking about: Are you the kind of provider, or do you have the potential to be the provider that we want at the the end? Mm -hmm. Right. That's one of the reasons for the interview. Um, and so. Just being yourself, show your personality, have a little sense of humor, be personable. Almost, I, I don't know if I've ever met a PA who's not personable. It's part of our culture of our profession. I'm sure they're out there. There's like a couple. A couple, but most people who are PAs are personable. Yes. This is part of our, our profession. So that's what we're looking for every applicant to be. So prepare, but just answer in a relaxed, flexible way. You can be friendly, but don't swear. <laughs> don't use too much lingo. You're still expected to be a professional, no matter what age you are and what your experiences are. So yeah. it's that just that balance that you get from practice, right? Come across mature, professionally, relaxed, and answer the questions that are asked of you. I think those are the key pieces. This is going to be random, uh, but I found people that say the word yeah a lot in the right way. I, I feel like a lot of PAs can relate to them. It, <laughs> it just shows a lot of confidence. So maybe not necessarily the word yeah, but when you're asked a question, like Dr. Palferman just said, don't be a robot and go, yes, that is a good question. Beep, boop, boop, bop. I am going to pull out a response. Um, but also don't be like, yo, homie, yeah, that one time when I was, okay, no. Two extremes. So you want to be in the middle. You want to say, oh, good question. Or, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I'm making the point correctly, but you just want to show confidence that the question didn't just throw you off guard, that you have a response. And if you don't quite yet, it's okay to say, can I have a couple of seconds to kind of gather my thoughts here? Absolutely. Who's going to say no? Yeah. Let me think about that for a second. And Good just question. Can I think about that just for a second? I think that shows, um, I love when applicants do that because yeah. it shows they're listening and they're thinking and they're processing. We yeah. all process in different ways, especially when we're nervous. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to take a moment. If you don't understand what they're asking, ask them to restate it. Can you clarify what you're looking for? That's okay. It's that's perfectly acceptable to, um, to do. So that's um, for the, that's for the individual interview when you're sitting one-on-one -on -one or maybe two faculty members, but it's just you, right? Okay. So know your application very well. Be ready to talk about any part of it. 
uh, definitely know your why and why that particular school, and you should be essentially good. There's not much more that's going to be talked about. Um, yeah. Another thing for the individual, if the applicant or if the interviewer is kind of agreeable with this, they're not like ultra professional themselves where they just want to ask a question, get the answer and be done with it. If you read the room and the person is kind of warm, conversational, welcoming, maybe ask them about themselves a little bit, make it more of a conversation than just like interview, interviewee, you know? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, part of the, we talked about this earlier about, um, not only is the program interviewing you, but you're interviewing the program. Right. Right. So when you go in person, or even if you're doing Zoom interviews, you'll get a feel of what the faculty are like. Yes. Do you have an opportunity to see the faculty interact with the students? Mm -hmm. What are the students like in the hallways? Do you hear laughter between classes, depending on where you're interviewing? Mm -hmm. Are they popping in? I always love to grab them out of the hall if, if they're, they're walking by and have them just instantaneously start talking to applicants. Mm -hmm. That gives you an overall feeling, the atmosphere at that program. Yes. And so, you know, I've heard from applicants sometimes that some programs want to stress the applicant out to see what they're like under pressure. They're already under pressure. This doesn't make any sense to me. How you're going to be in a code doesn't, it, is not reflective of how you are on the day of your interview. So okay. really our goal is just to get to know the applicant. Mm -hmm. And um, and I hope that most PA programs are, are looking for the same sort of thing. And we can only do that if you are authentic and relaxed and sharing, you know, really who you are. Another thing that sometimes comes up is if if somebody cries in the interview. This this happens more than one would think. Sometimes, yeah. or, and I'll tell you why. It depends on what we're talking about. So we oh yeah we always talk about something in the application mm -hmm. that um, besides just our standard questions. So there might be something that they wrote about, you know, something their, their parents divorce, you know, the death of a loved one, an experience that was really hard for them. And so sometimes students tear up um, or when they talk about challenges they've overcome. Mm -hmm. It's okay to tear up. Yeah. You know, I, I have a habit of, I always have, <laughs> I'm always ready for anybody yep. tearing up because it's so stressful and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Don't that to me shows a level of bravery and feeling and don't let that um, undermine your whole interview is my point. It's OK. It happens. And if you need a moment, you can take a moment. It's OK. That definitely. So that's not a piece of advice I would have ever given. So that's definitely interesting that you brought that up. And it's kind of consistent and congruent with the fact that you said like a patient's interview, a patient interaction is tremendously intimate. Yeah. Uh, just from the get-go and so is your relationship with your mentors at the school the program director your professors because it is so hard and it takes so much of you that you kind of have to be comfortable sharing you know yourself as well and it doesn't seem like it would be a stretch to say that can start at the interview yeah. you know because you're writing about such personal things these people know so much about you you know you can kind of treat them like somebody that you know and trust already even if it's somebody that you're meeting for the first time yeah we we are aware that there's so much on the line mm -hmm. when somebody comes in for an interview the number of hours that they've already put in to getting to that yeah. spot is massive yes you think of all the patient care writing all of the essays doing the whole caspa application mm -hmm. it, literally that moment in their lives could be a path going this way or that way yeah. on the interview. That's a tremendous amount of pressure. So we're completely aware of that. And, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You want to maintain some level of professionalism. So I'll just say, if you're crying through the whole interview, then maybe you're not ready, you know, depending on what that is, you, you know, it, that is the rare case that happens, mm -hmm. but because um, one needs to be able to manage their emotions, but we don't want robots either. So it's it's OK when you're talking about challenging things to show some some level of emotion. It's OK. It's a good distinction. Somebody yeah. who's just generally overwhelmed and doesn't and is beside themselves with the whole process. Maybe you're not ready. 
Um, yeah. yeah, if your parents divorced or someone died or something that the interviewer happens to bring up or that you happen to bring up, you're human. Yeah. It's okay to be human. Yeah. We, had a, we had an applicant, it's been years now, her, her brother died in a motorcycle accident mm -hmm. like a week before she interviewed. Wow. I mean, devastating loss. Yeah. And so she, she made us aware and said, I'm going to still come for my interview. My parents mm -hmm. are going to join me, not into the interview room, but just to the campus. I just oh, want sure. to be aware that this happened. So she came, we acknowledged, and we gave our condolences. And she maintained a very professional level throughout that entire interview. She was accepted outright that minute because her ability yeah. to function under that really challenging situation um, was very apparent. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the communication. Had we not known, she would have been great as well and probably got in. But her communicating with us from the beginning that this devastating thing happened so recently um, showed us that she's not afraid to communicate when things are challenging. Did she, did she communicate that as an explanation for why her mom and dad were there or just because she wanted you to know? I think it was both. She wanted us to know her parents were coming and why she was, you know, if we see her parents, she didn't want to think it was some level of sure maturity. We People bring their parents because people come from all over the country. I don't think anything about it when they show up with their parents. I love chatting with parents. Um, I think that, so it was one, but she doesn't know that. Applicants yeah. don't know that. Right. So that was one right. point. And the other thing is she just wanted us to know, I think in case things derailed, mm. that we would have some understanding. Now it didn't derail. She handled every component of the interview exquisitely. Mm -hmm. um, but it was good that she made us aware because we wouldn't have known if it had derailed, we would have had a little bit more understanding as to why it derailed. So my point is just yeah. communication. Again, it's the communication piece, mm -hmm. but we looked at it as the positive. Okay. She communicated about this. So when she's a student, she'd be more likely to communicate versus somebody who keeps things so closed mm -hmm. and shut away. Yeah, that, that shows a tremendous amount of maturity and just planning ahead, just like the person who knew that they needed a support system. So they set those things up ahead of time that you mentioned previously. Yeah, that, that's a, a green flag factory right there. That person can definitely handle hard things because they know themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And you're pointing out these themes. They come across through the application, through the interview. It's a way of being. These are the things that make strong PA students because they make strong healthcare providers. Sure. Right? It's ultimately yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, school is just a microcosm of practice. It's you're yeah. throwing out there in the wolves. You have a, a, everything is on the line, just like everything is on the line with each exam. Yeah, everything's on the line with each patient. So it's not getting through school and then you're you're good. But no, you're not. It's it's mm -hmm. a tiny amount of stress compared to actual clinical practice. So that's what they're getting you ready for. Exactly. So it's the same thing for the rest of your life as a clinician is putting those things in place. If you know you're not good talk to someone about that, get maybe another, you know, get support, get whatever you need. Yeah. So, and she was doing that from literally before day one in the interview. So yeah. that, that was tremendous, tremendous maturity, I think. Yeah, um, exactly. So yeah, I can't really say much more about the interview as far as individual. I mean, we can go into the nitty gritty, the group interviews, the writing sample, there, there's a bunch of things we can talk about, um, but we could also save that for the next one or, or another time. I've, I've kept you for two hours already. Um, the one thing I really did want to touch on, if you have even five more minutes, yeah. Yeah. is your personal evolution into the role that you're in, because most PAs do not do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, most PAs, you know, practice, and then they might practice in one or two or three specialties, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You decided to pursue education, and then on top of education, now you're leading a program. How did all that happen? What made you decide to go in that direction? Uh, so I mentioned before I was in sales and marketing yeah. before I went to PA school, found a calling in medicine, went to PA school and worked in women's health for a couple of years. So I spent my time on a labor and delivery floor, delivering babies, assisting with C-sections, um, monitoring labor, and then time in a antenatal clinic. Uh, and I worked with students 
within that. So I precepted medical students and PA students, sometimes um, paramedic students, sometimes nursing students. I loved working with students. I loved having the opportunity to provide them um, clinical experiences mm -hmm. that would make a difference. And I don't know if you've ever been a preceptor, but it they students slow down the provider, right? For for a lot of providers, it's hard to work with students, and and I I just loved it. So I realized that I really liked patient care, but I really liked the teaching component of seeing students when they get excited, engaged, when the synapses are firing, when the connections are being made from what they learned in class to the mm -hmm. clinic, to the patient that's sitting in front of them. So all of those pieces um, were some of the ways that I started to segue into PA education. While I was working clinically, I started doing lectures for, um, for Rutgers and I provided all of the women's health and OBGYN lectures. Mm -hmm. So I found a connection to the, to the university that way. And um, I just found at the time when I did it, it was the right time where I was working primarily clinically, but tapping my toes into the educational piece. And then I flipped it to where I took a job as a general faculty member, but I was still working clinically. So um, I did that. I've been working in PA education for 25 years. So it's been a really long time. And um, it. what I love about working in education is, I mean, we, how lucky am I? I'm surrounded by really smart, educated, passionate, inspired young people every day. I mean, how many people get to say that? I work with people who literally want to change the world. So I, and I, that sounds so, you know, fluffy, but <laughs> young people, I mean, everybody comes in, they, they want, they, every student holds themselves to such a high level. They have high expectations for themselves. They want to be good. And so it's a really great environment to work in. And it makes me want to be good as an educator. I want to make sure that I provide them with, with what they need to be that humanistic, patient-centered provider. Um, so I was a general faculty member for a long time. Then I moved into the director of admissions role, oh. so, which is why I'm so passionate, I think. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about admissions. So I really got to dig deep into what we were looking for, why we were looking for it, what were the processes that we had in place to make sure that we not only attracted the kind of student that we want, but made sure that we accepted the kind of student that we wanted and then successfully supported them through the program so that they could graduate. Mm -hmm. And um, I always liked leadership roles and making decisions. And uh, so I've been program director for about three years and uh, I, I love it. It's, it's great. It's every day is different. And what I love about it is I still have the opportunity to interact with students almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But I also get to drive the curriculum the way that I, that, that, myself and the rest of the faculty see PA education of what it should be and how it is going to build the future of healthcare and the profession. So who, who wouldn't want to do that every day? <laughs> uh, it's not who wouldn't want to, it's who is capable and qualified as much as you are. Um, and also not to be too fluffy, as, as you mentioned, I love that word for that. <laughs> um, but I think you've done a absolutely exemplary phenomenal job and i think that every program in the country should be structured like yours is uh, from the admission from going holistic and really finding the right people not just based on grades and stats but based on personality and the things that they've accomplished in their lives and overcome in their lives and also the way the program is structured with breaks a little bit longer 
going through the fundamentals and the basic sciences in addition to the just bare bones uh, clinical skills. It's, I can't think of any better way to structure a PA program than what you've done. So literally just bravo to you and everything that you've done. This program is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have to say the faculty here are phenomenal mm -hmm. as well. We, the, the level of commitment um, and care towards not only the organization and the curriculum and building the best educational experience for the students, but the level of care for the students, mm -hmm. it's just the faculty are, are amazing, um, skilled, qualified, come from all different specialties, medical specialties, and everyone has different expertise. So some of them are public health, and legislation and pushing workforce issues for PAs. Some people it's about accreditation and assessment. Mm -hmm. um, others have to do with licensing. So it, everybody, it's, it's all, we're all so intertwined that with the shared idea that we want this to be a great experience. And so I'm just lucky I get to be the, the leader of this exemplary group of faculty that I that I work with. Um, and then there's the staff. I mean, we, we have to mention the staff of any PA program. Um, here at Records, they're the backbone of everything that we do. The staff tend to be the first touch point for any applicant, for the students during the day. And so they are vitally important. We've actually had applicants who've told us that they decided to ultimately come to Rutgers because of the experience and the interactions they had with the staff. So we are really so grateful to their commitment to our mission and everything they do every day. Yeah, can't do what you do without them. There's no yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to everybody who makes this wonderful program possible. And the students, I mean, the students keep us honest. They, 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 they have no, no problem telling us their perspective or, you know, changes that they think we should make. And we, we welcome that. It's bi-directional. So while they're coming to us to, for an education, I really see it as a, a respectful relationship between student and faculty. We have our obligations, students have their obligations, and we work together to achieve the same goals. And I think with that philosophy, um, it makes, it makes everything else come out in the wash. So it all works. So, and I thank you for, for um, recognizing the length of, of um, the, the amount of time that we've been in PA education and the efforts that we, that we make. So thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've discussed this with a number of, you know, leadership in various programs. I've obviously gone through my own program, uh, which was great. Uh, but just everything that I'm hearing, the way that Elijah talks about the program, the way that James talks about the program, the things Michelle and Brianna had mentioned, uh, every time I hear them say something, I go, really, they do that? That's almost too good to be true. Like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So a little bit jealous. I, I wish if I would do it all over again, I'd apply to Rutgers, but I didn't even consider it when I was a, a PA student. Uh, but no, absolutely awesome program. Thank you. And I'll just say, you just named a couple of students who are proactive, mm -hmm. build the relationships with the faculty, um, are self-assertive. Yes. You're right? right. So it's it's that bi-directional thing. Also, you know, there's students that barely ever come see us. They mm -hmm. come to PA school, they do their thing, they do well, they don't feel the need to have this close relationship with the faculty. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. Yeah. But for those who need that or want that, we're we're here for it. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, I think we basically covered our entire our entire topic list. Is there anything that you would, uh, you know, reflecting back on this later today, you'd feel bad about leaving out or anything kind of left unsaid? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we covered we we covered everything. You know, one thing that we we didn't really cover about the essay, but I think this is important and I, I see this sometimes happen, is we, we've talked a lot about the why, mm -hmm. right? So we often see the first time somebody meets a PA, 
-hmm. it's because they had surgery themselves. They were an athlete and they had, you know, an injury and they met somebody in the ER. They had a sibling who had special needs. Sure. They had a parent who died or, or whatever that story is. You can tell that story in your essay. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be your entire essay. Mm -hmm. It's just a segue. It's just a starting point, a jump off point to share as to your why mm -hmm. versus the entire essay. So yes. I think it's okay. And you talked about writing Russian in your essay. The first, yeah, the first sentence. Yeah. I'm thinking of this one essay where the applicant was house sitting a monkey for the doctor <laughs> and the monkey got out of the cage and talked about, you know, running after the cage. I still remember that first sentence. I'll never forget that. Second, I'll never forget that. Right? So, and these, whatever the reason is that you're interested, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Use your space in the essay wisely. Is really, you know, for all the things that we've talked about mm -hmm. here, um, every word and character and space that you use it's really a fundamental piece of the essay that you can't overlook because we read them. So make sure every word matters. The monkey is such a great example. Yes. Um, I, I said this once and I'm going to say it again. You out of 20 random people, go to the mall, look at 20 people. What is different about you? I guarantee you 19 out of those 20 people have not babysat a monkey. I have not. Yeah. I, I never want to. They're terrifying. They're, they scare me. Um, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, so just what is the one thing about your life, whether it's something you experienced, the way you were born, the language you speak, the things you've seen or done, what is one thing that's super unique about you? Make that first. Yeah. After that, talk about your why, the, the thing that I mentioned in the book, why, 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 why PA, and right. then make it clear that you understand the profession and that you really appreciate it and what you want out of the profession. Um, and maybe if you happen to be like, you know, you're behind the eight ball a little bit, you had some struggles maybe consider talking about how you overcame those. If you could include those things, your essay is going to be top 10 easily. Yeah. yeah. Easily. Even in reaps, I'll see in, in the main CASPA Apple, uh, essay mm -hmm. where people will say, last year I was unsuccessful getting into PA school. I reflected. I did X, Y, and Z. I realized I wasn't ready or I wasn't as competitive. And so I did, you know, A, B, and C. Sure. I think, again, it's that accountability piece. Every school wants a student who takes accountability, who is self-reflective and introspective mm -hmm. uh, because those are fundamental pieces of being a PA. Mm -hmm. Reaching out for help. It is a fundamental piece of being a PA. You're not a completely independent provider. Right. So we're looking for those people who don't have a problem saying, I don't know, because you have to do that as a PA. Mm -hmm. right? So all of that can be explored in the essay. And demonstrate those things. Don't say them like, this is my characteristic. Demonstrate it. Give me an example. Exactly. And if we could do that, that that's just, that's going to be phenomenal. But way more on that in the yes. book. Yes. Um, oh, there's a thumbnail, by the way. Well, it's good. I'm going to look into it. Uh, I mean, I sent every one of those four students, I've sent them multiple copies so they can probably just give you one or I'll send them more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Happy to give you, if you have like a pre PA club, I'll give you a few copies. Okay, great. I just thought of another thing to yeah. uh, general advice, find out of the programs that one is applying to, if there's any way that they could speak one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. to uh, either a faculty member or a student, if they have any info sessions coming up and really take advantage of that. So, you know, we have Zoom, we have info sessions that we do a couple of times a year mm -hmm. and we know who registers, we know who comes multiple times. So though that shows interest in the program. Yeah. Um, if you have an individual situation where you're not sure, even if you're just thinking about PA school, you're thinking about applying, would it be better if I do this or that? Rutgers allows, all faculty put aside time in their calendar to speak one-on-one. -on -one. It's amazing to me how many applicants don't take advantage of that. Now, it doesn't mean you have to, you may not need to, but if you're not sure or you're changing careers and you just feel like you want to talk it out with somebody, 
Mm -hmm. Find out if the programs that you're applying to will allow such a thing. And then follow up, especially after your interview. So, you know, interview processes often take months. Mm -hmm. You'll apply, you might interview, and then it takes a long time to hear. If there's updates that you want the program to know about, I encourage applicants to let us know. Mm -hmm. I took this extra class. I got more patient care. I'm still interested in your program. Because even when we fill a class, we have a group of waitlist applicants. Sure. We think about those students who are admissions group. They get to know who some of these students are. Mm -hmm. Because they're emailing, they're calling, they're communicating with us. We're more likely to fill a vacant spot with somebody who is really continues to demonstrate interest in our program mm -hmm. versus somebody who interviewed and we never heard from again. Yeah. So I think those, you know, you're not bothering programs, especially by emailing them mm -hmm. uh, and, and demonstrating your continued interest in, in whatever program it is. Yeah. Probably don't email them 10 times a day, every day, you might get some sort of a unsubscribe function applied to you. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, Use your judgment maybe every couple of weeks, every month or so, follow up while you're on your journey. And I can't imagine a better, like a bigger green flag than somebody who might not be super competitive. They talk to someone like you or somebody in the admissions department and they ask, what should I do? Should I do a post back? Should I go get a master's? Should I retake some classes? And then they do all those things and they come back two years later or a year later and they've done that. It's yeah. like, that's, it doesn't get any better than that. This person takes feedback, they put in the work, they're really motivated. Why would you not want to accept someone like that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And they're identifying the weaknesses. Yes. So if the weakness is your grades mm -hmm. and all you continue to do is get patient care hours, you haven't addressed the weakness. Correct. And this is, this is a really important thing. I know on, on our website, we have a list of FAQs where if one is declined, we have self-reflective questions that one should ask themselves. Mm. And I think it's an important tool, not only if you're declined, but before you even apply, are you ready to apply? Mm -hmm. And to look at that list. Are you a competitive applicant? And so, um, because it's a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of emotional energy that goes into doing CASPA applications. So you, you wanna make sure that your application is, is ready. Um. Really glad you guys do that. I'm actually, for a future video, I'm going to go to that list of are you ready to apply criteria and discuss them with my audience, uh, because that's something I wish people would kind of take reflection on. And then if they are, those are the things that you talk about in your essay, you know, so that's a exactly. goal line of good information. Yeah. If you want, um, I'll, I'll send you the link. I'll okay. find it for you. I appreciate that. And I'll send yeah. you some books. Okay, perfect. Yep. Cool. We'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, anything else you think you'd like to mention at all? No, I think, I think we about covered it. The one thing that we started talking about before we even recorded that I'm not going to like discuss at length, but you said how, so one thing we were going to talk about is like, is this, is the field saturated? Is it worth it becoming a PA anymore? And you said that's as far from the truth as possible because there's so many PA jobs just popping up. You've never seen it like this. This is yeah. like time to be a PA. I would say that the work, the the opportunity for work for PAs, especially new grads, mm -hmm. is stronger than I've seen it in 25 years. Which is very good news. Very good news. Now, very I can't good. talk about every state, but I, I can talk about the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, tri-state area, mm -hmm. is that there are so many jobs, yeah. so many opportunities. In fact, so our students graduate in May, and one said they were, they were, using all these job offers <laughs> against each one to salary and benefits. Yep. Everybody who wants a job. So they graduated in May, we're at the beginning of July. Anybody who was actively looking for a job has been offered at least one job and is in the accreditation process mm -hmm. right now, if not almost ready to work. Yeah, so, find, me, find me another field where that's the case. Exactly. Even and, one. Exactly. I mean, I mean I'm sure, but it's it's great. They're like making um, demands is too strong of a word, but you know they're 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 having a lot more say, I think, mm -hmm. than I've than I've ever seen before, 
And so it's a really good time to be in PA school. Mm -hmm. And I encourage if people apply and they are unsuccessful that first year, but this is really what they want to do, put in the work um, to be able to re reapply for the next year because it's a great profession mm -hmm. and um, it's going to be around and it's, it's just a great, great place to work. Yeah. Great thing to do. Tremendous job. You will always have a job as long as you, you know, maintain your license and you're good at your job. You're never going to be without work. You make very good money. It's a great lifestyle. There's work-life balance, especially if you get the right position. Yeah. As, as they told me in the Navy, there's room at the top. You know, there's a lot of room at the bottom. There is some people in the middle, but there's always room at the top for the people that want to do what it takes to be at the top. There's so few of them that there's always room at the top. Um, yeah. So if you are somebody who is academically capable and you prove it, you're empathetic, you understand yourself and others, you want to help others, there's room at the top for you. Yeah. And it's there's no better time to be a PA, as as Dr. Pelferman just said. So put in the work, guys, you can do it. Yeah. And I'll just say also that everybody who goes to PA school thinks about being a clinician, which is great. Sure. But what I've seen over the last 25 years is there's so many other opportunities besides clinical work that just keeps expanding as the oh, yes. as the profession matures. More roles, more niches. More for roles. I mean, just in PA education, there's so many jobs in PA education. We can't fill all the PA education right. jobs for all the programs, right? But even just in legislation, in um, decision making, in the hospital, managerial positions, within pharmaceutical companies and um, other business sectors, we're really a pretty young profession, if you think, only the late years. 60s. So we just now have the first PAs who are retiring. Mm -hmm. But as, as we graduate more and more PAs, there's people who are looking for other opportunities beyond clinical work. So oh. the sky's the limit in what's going to happen with the profession and where the opportunities will be to make an impact, I say, in the next 30 to 50 years. Well, you know, we'll see. It's exciting to see. To that person on TikTok who said, is it worth it to become a PA? It's a resounding yes, guys. It's a resounding yes. It's a fantastic profession. Yes. Sky's the limit, like she just said. So yeah, absolutely. If you're interested, put in the work, you guys can do it. Yeah. Dr. Palferman, thank you so much for taking so much time and all the wonderful answers you gave. I think we're going to help a lot of people with this information. Great. Great. It was my pleasure. And certainly if, if anybody is ever thinking about applying to Rutgers or just wants to drop me an email. You can find me on the website and I answer all emails that I get uh, because I really feel passionate about mentoring and helping the next generation of PAs. So certainly, of course, you can reach out to me or, or anybody listening to the video. I'm, I'm happy to, to interact. Absolutely. And I'll put the link to the Rutgers website, you know, first thing in the information for this video. So y'all don't have to go search for it, but yeah, thank Great. you very much. I'm going to end the recording here.